All right, let's get started. So uh, PS4 is due tomorrow. Please notice that there are two parts. You'll be implementing some loop methods. You'll be creating an animation. You can do both. We've seen uh, an alarming number handed in already missing the animation. So be sure you do both. We have lots of uh, TA help, as I've told you. You can make appointments with TAs for one on one consultation. If you make an appointment, either show up or cancel. Don't just blow it off. That's very unprofessional. Um, so keep that in mind. Any questions or problems before we start? All right, well, I got a question for you. What is it, I mean, to this point, you've been writing mostly pieces of programs. Or if it's an entire program, I've written part of it for you. Up to this point, what's, what's the biggest stumbling block to creating, say, a, 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 a program that interacts with the user in a reasonable way? A complete program as opposed to pieces. What do you think? What is it we don't, we haven't talked about? Well, I got a question for you. That we need to, yeah. Okay, you say we haven't talked much about getting input from the user. That's true, but we do have a way to get input from the user. Maybe not the most amazing ways, but we have a way. We have several ways. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, we haven't talked about like creating our own object types. Yeah, we haven't talked about, you know, we've been using lots of different types of objects from the Java library. We haven't talked about creating our own. Um, that's true, but people were writing programs before there was object-oriented programs, so it's not absolutely essential. Yeah. Well, we haven't talked about graphical user interfaces, but, you know, you know, we have a way to pop up a question and display a result. So, any other ideas? What's limiting us? Yeah. Say it again. Yeah, but I'm, I'm happy just to have one way. Let me, let me show you this program here. So this one, when you run it, this is what I mean by complete program. So I run it, and it asks for a non-negative number. I enter 88. I say OK, and it displays the square root is whatever. So if that's a complete program. A user can run it, interact with it, get a result back. You know, it's not a very useful program. It's not a very powerful program, but that's what I mean by a complete program. It's not just a method that computes square roots. It's a program. So there's a program. Why am I saying that we really aren't equipped? Yeah? If the user enters a negative number, then... All right. He said if the user enters a negative number, things are going to go bad. So if I say enter a non-negative number and I say minus 8, and I say OK, it says the square root is NAN. That's not a very useful, that stands for not a number. That's not a very useful answer to give. Uh, suppose I enter a number and I say cancel. I've never, no one's ever clicked the cancel button, or I haven't. Ah, we get a null pointer exception. What the heck is that? All right, if I uh, run the program again, and instead of hitting a number, I just enter some garbage like that, and I say OK, I get a number format exception. All things we don't want the user to experience. I mean, what, what should happen when the user enters a, a, you know, a non-number or a negative number or hits cancel? What would you expect a program to do? Yeah? Yeah, tell them what they did wrong and give them a chance to do it again. Yeah. So the main thing that's been that the main thing that's missing to this point that prevents us from doing a good job of this is dealing with exceptions. To this point in the class, whenever an exception occurs, it's a disaster. The program ends. It just prints something weird out in the console and dies. It doesn't have to be like that. It turns out that when you call a method that throws an exception, you can deal with the exception. You can learn that an exception was thrown and do something about it. You can catch the exceptions. So we have no problem getting exceptions to be thrown. 
Lots of, lots of your programs throw exceptions at various times. The trick is catching them, doing something about it. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, before we do that, a few things I want to show you. Up above, we were using dialogs dot show input dialog. And unfortunately, J. Shell wants to bury it here. I'm going to hit cancel. Now, normally, when you say OK, whatever string was typed into the box is uh, returned as the result to wherever it was called. If I hit cancel, though, let's see what happens. What's returned is null. So the first thing we need to investigate is, what is this null thing? Um, well, I'll tell you. Null, first of all, if you can write null in a program, it's an expression. So the, the, the word null, the keyword null, is an expression. And it has a value, which is null. So you can think of it as a literal. It sort of evaluates to itself. And what null is, it's a special value that can take the place of an object. So for example, if I say string s equals null, then that variable s contains null. Now, there's not much you can do with null. If you try to say s dot substring, take the substring of null, it's going to tell you null pointer exception. You cannot invoke a method on null. Think of it as a way of saying, you know, typically variables contain references to objects. Null is sort of a missing reference. It says, I don't have a reference to an object. There's no reference in this variable. So you can't invoke methods on, on null. But one thing you can do is compare them to other objects. So I can say, is hello the same as null? And what's the answer going to be? Right, so the object hello is, you know, that string hello is a reference to some place in memory with the letters H-E-L-L-O, that's not null, so I get false back. But what if I say is S equal to null? That's true, because we stored S in null. Uh, so you can compare the equality and inequality. That's about all. So what good is null? Why bother with null? Think, any of you think any good reasons to have a null value? Sure. Actually, I just have a question. Yes. Yeah. Does, does null have a value in the ASCII table or in the Unicode? No. No, null, he asked, does null have a value in the Unicode table? No, it's not a character. It's just null. <coughs> okay. No ideas? Yeah. Okay, so null is often used to, uh, as a return value to say, I don't have an object for you. It's a way of, of making, sort of, of saying it, that something strange happened. So if you call um, show input dialog and it returns null, that's how it, show input dialog tells you that cancel was hit. So if OK was hit, you're going to get back a string, a non null string. If cancel was hit, you get back null. And you can test for that, and you find out that if you got null, then um, that means cancel was hit, and you can take appropriate action. Okay. Um, so, one, yeah? So, what's your term if they don't type anything and hit OK? And, okay, if nothing is typed in and you hit OK, you get an empty string back. So, it's just. Okay. And an empty string is not null. An empty string. You know, is a string object. It doesn't have any characters in it, but it is not. No, that's false. Okay, so it just gives you an extra value to play with. Sometimes you declare a variable up that holds that holds an object type, and you don't know you don't have an object to put in the variable right now. But Java wants you to initialize it, so you store null in it, sort of a placeholder. And null, not so you can have null strings, but you can have null arrays, you can have null anything. Any object type, you can use null as a value. Yeah? You just if, you, if you declare string s semicolon, he's asking, is that the same as doing string s gets null? And it's not. 
if you just declare a variable and you say string s, JShell stores a null in it. But uh, in, the rule in Java is it's uninitialized, and you have to explicitly initialize it before you can use it. But JShell's taking care of initializing it for us. Okay, so uh, null shows up a lot. But th the problem is, you could imagine writing methods. Let's say you write a method that's supposed to compute a double. It's supposed to maybe interact with the user and get a double and return it, and uh, say a positive double. So you might start thinking, what are all the things that could go wrong? Well, the user could cancel. The user could enter something that's not a number. And you could say, OK, if the user enters something that's not a number, we'll return negative 1. If they enter something that's uh, not a positive double, we'll return negative 2. Uh, if the user hits cancel, we'll return negative 3. You could start inventing values that signal that various things happen. Uh, but unfortunately, that's hard to generalize. Why won't that work all the time? To use particular values to say that, that bad things happen. Yeah. If the input that they put in actually returns that value, then you'll get a false. Okay. So if you have a method that say it's supposed to return a double, there are not any leftover doubles to signal the problem with. Any double is a valid return value, so you can't just say, okay, negative one, we're not going to use it. We're going to use that to signal the problem. So uh, when a uh, method wants to tell you that something went wrong, null is often returned, but that's often not enough. And that's what exceptions are for. Um, let's throw an exception. So far, all the exceptions that you have uh, seen have been generated by methods that you've called. But there is a, key, there's a, a statement called a throw statement in Java. So you can say throw new and there's a bunch of exceptions built into Java, so I'm going to create a new runtime exception object and throw it. Okay? So that's how you throw an exception. We'll, we'll look at this in the context of the program later. So programs can throw exceptions. Programs can also catch exceptions, and that's what we're at. So let's, um, we'll come back to the square root program after I've shown you a few things about exceptions. So here's our first example of a program that actually takes advantage of the ability to catch exceptions. So you can see I have called dialogs.showInputDialog, and it displays enter degrees Fahrenheit, and I get the input. And then I try to uh, I parse the input as a double, I convert it, I display the result. Now what can go wrong when I'm doing those three things? What could go wrong? Yeah. If the, if, if the user inputs a string. Okay. So if the user inputs a string, say this this wasn't digits. Suppose that what was entered was hello. When we go try to parse it, we try to go parse that uh, input into a double. It's going to throw a number format exception. And if you go look at the documentation for parse double, you can see right down here it says it throws a null pointer exception if the string is null, and it says it throws a number format exception if the string does not contain a parsable double. So notice I have put these three statements inside a try catch. So the way a try catch works is a new kind of statement. It says try to execute the code in the body of the try. If an exception is thrown, if a number format exception is thrown, you come right here and execute the catch block. So what that means is, if I come here and I type in garbage, what's going to happen? What's, what's going to be displayed? That message. Yeah, that message. A box will pop up saying invalid temperature entered. And what happened is, this method here threw a number format exception. And since it was thrown inside this try block, this code gets activated and it displays invalid temperature entered. On the other hand, if I ran it and I actually entered a valid number, then no exception is thrown 
and uh, this code is all executed, and then we skip over the catch block and go over to, go on to whatever follows. So when you execute code in the try block, you can attach catch pieces that catch specific exceptions, and uh, you know customize the behavior when that happens. So it's fundamentally very simple. The trick is you have to know what exceptions may be thrown. Now, what about if I come here and I hit cancel? What's going to happen? What will my program do when I hit cancel? Where will a, where will a problem occur? What will the value of input be? Yeah? Well, let me back up. We're call show input dialog, the user hits cancel. What value will be stored in input? Nothing. Yeah. Not nothing. No. Show input dialog does not throw an exception. It, if someone hits cancel, it, it returns null. And so in string input right here will contain null. Now, what about down here? Where, where will that null value cause a problem? Yeah? Okay, well, it'll try to parse null, and what's it going to do? What's going to happen when you try to parse null? Yeah? It'll throw null pointer exception. Right, if we look at the documentation again, it says throws a null pointer exception if the string is null. So I need to go find my, uh, I'll just run the program again. So I'll run it. Now, so this is going to throw a number format exception. Will that get, not a number, but a um, null pointer exception. So if, will it, so it'll happen, will it be caught right here? And no, it's not, it's not a number format exception, so it won't be caught. What will happen? The exception will, I mean, what, what will you see happen on the screen when, when this exception occurs and we don't catch it? You're, you're, all, you're all experts at that. You know what happens. Yeah, program crashes and burdens. Displays a stack trace on the console. So uh, let's run it here. Cancel. Boom. We find out there was a null pointer exception, and it uh, happened. We were, on line, we were on line 20 of the program, and then you can see it called parse double, which called another parse double, which called read format string, which threw the exception. And no one along the way caught the exception. If an exception makes it all the way back to the main method and isn't caught there, the program crashes. That's what you've been seeing. Okay. So how could we fix that problem? What should we do anyway? Suppose that low pointer exception is thrown. What should we do when that happens? Yeah? Try to catch the exception. Sure, we can catch the exception. And then once we've caught it, well, let's catch it. What would it take to catch the exception? Wait a second. Yeah? Um, I, what is it, are, are you entering in just a blank space when S asks you for the degrees no. F because? I'm just hitting cancel. Oh, cancel, all right. That's, and so cancel stores a null in input. It causes this method to throw a null, a null pointer exception. So how could I catch it? What do you think, yeah? Yeah, you can repeat. He said, add another catch block. And so we're supposed to be trying to catch a no pointer, no pointer exception. Okay? So if a number format exception is thrown, it'll be dealt with here. If a no pointer exception is thrown, it'll be dealt with here. Yeah? Does it matter which one of the catch blocks are in? Yes, does it matter which order the catch blocks are in? Uh, yes, it does. But it's a little hard to explain why right now. Uh, I'm going to hold off on answering that question. Now, what should we do right here? What should we do when we notice that a null pointer exception has been thrown? Over there, yeah. Uh, just close the dialog box? Yeah, well, the dialog box is going to close anyway. So we just do nothing, right? There's no need to do anything. 
the user hit canceled. So that's, you know, what we want to have happen is the user hits cancel, it's canceled. The program's over. We don't want to see an uncatch, you know, an uncalled exception. We just want to gracefully exit. That's what the user wanted. Now, what would be another way to deal with this as opposed to catching this null pointer exception? Suppose you didn't want to catch the null pointer exception. Yeah? Um, well, am I, I'm sorry, but I, I had to quote a different question. So what does E mean? Why does it have number format exception okay. except in E? Why Fair question. What's that E for? <laughs> yeah? Is it like the name of it as, it as if it were a variable? The name of what? Yeah, an exception is an object, and so e is the object, and so in this, uh, in here, you could do something like e dot. Uh, you could do like oh yeah. Also, how do you do that sys out nope. thing? You need to raise your hand. Okay, so we, we do this, and let's say I cancel. I I. I had it print to the console that object E, and we find out it's, it's the way it prints is java.line.nullpointer exception. Okay? We could do something like this. This is the other common thing to do, is to do, a, a, to do uh, print stack trace. And so if that happens, and I hit cancel, I get. I'm, now I'm the one displaying the stack tricks. My code displays the stack tricks. In the CPM, when an exception occurs internally, what I have is a catch block that catches any exception that's thrown, that makes it to the top, displays a message to you that says something went wrong, please try again. And then it takes the stack trace, just like I showed you, and saves it so I can look at it later. That's a very common thing. So, uh, the, 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 your first question was, what's the E for? It's just... Uh, it's the exception that was called. You don't have to call it E, I just do, that's my habit. Often you don't, need, you don't worry about the exception object. She also asked, how do I do sys out so fast? What I do is I do sys out and I do control space, and it saves me some time. Oh. But what we were also talking about is, what's an alternative to catching the exception? Oh. How could we deal with that null more in a different way? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so if we want to use a cache block, Mm -hmm. uh, we can only catch the exceptions from the library that are existed in the Java Well, yeah, you, we, okay, so what he's asking is what kind of exceptions can you catch? Well, currently the only exceptions that exist are ones defined in the Java library. And these are defined by <coughs> java.lang.number format exception, java.lang.null pointer exception. There are lots of them scattered throughout the library. You can create your own new exceptions, but we're not ready to talk about that yet. We have to get to where we're doing talking about classes, yeah? So you only run the call and try if it's not null. Well, okay, so it says you only run the code in the try if it's not null. So this code gets run regardless. But if this method terminates by throwing an exception, nothing is stored in tempf, this is not executed, this is not executed. It goes outside, it goes down to the catches and tries to find something that catches that exception. If it doesn't find anything for that kind of exception, then the, met, then the main method throws the exception, lets the exception propagate. Now, if there were some method that called main, it would get a chance to catch it. But main, no one called main. So if the exception propagates all the way past main, game's over, program's done. Okay. How can we change our code so we don't have to worry about catching an old winter exception? Yeah? I'm not sure I heard that. So let, me, let me change the question. What code could I add right here? Just to, so the exception doesn't occur in the first place. Yeah? If input equals null, then Okay, so input is null. If the user hit cancel, in other words, we should end the program. We should end main. We just return from main. 
And now the exception never occurs. So we, you know, we can wipe that out. I'll just comment down. And now when we, uh, when we do it, uh, I hit cancel. It looks the same to the outside user. It's just we tested for null before we even got, before we even got to the point of calling parse couple. Yeah? So where do you assign like, that button cancel and null? Is it just like always that or something? I, it's, just, uh, it's just the way the method is written. He asked, why, why is it that cancel returns null? It's just the way. I'm just using this method, that's what this Java doc says. Somewhere down in there, somewhere down in the code for these things, it decides when to throw, when to return a null, when to throw an exception. So. All right, so that's a basic example of uh, catching an exception. Let's look at another one. Okay. So this says calculates and displays BMI based on input from the user. This is one that we've had in the past, we've seen in the past. And you'll see that inside the try block, I am, I have a method down here called show double input dialog, which throws a number format exception. So up here, I, I uh, ask the user for a height in inches and I get back a double or a number format exception is thrown. Same thing here, I ask for another, weight in pounds, I either get back a double or the exception is thrown. And assuming no exception was thrown, I calculate and display the BMI. But if a number format exception is thrown, right there, I catch it, display a, a message that says you in, entered an invalid measurement. So if I run that, so it's asking for height in inches, I'll enter something reasonable. And it asks for height, weight in pounds. I say okay. I get invalid measurement here because the exception was thrown and called. Now, this is the method. Oops. This is the method that throws the exception. Now look carefully at it. Do you see that it throws an exception? Do you see the keyword throw? How can we claim that this method will throw a number format exception when the, uh, the user input is garbage? When it obviously doesn't. It, there is no, it, it, we do not see it throwing an exception. And yet it does throw an exception. How, how, who could explain that? Yeah. Right, sure. Some methods are built to throw exceptions if something happens. But how does this one throw an exception? That's, that's the entire de definition. It doesn't look much different or any different. This is an example from earlier in, in the semester. So, yeah, what's going on? Yeah. It returns the result of the parse double method, and that method will throw an exception if yeah. the input is not valid. Yeah. So, what he said was this is the method, this method throws the exception. So someone calls show double input dialog, first thing it does is call show input dialog. If show input dialog throws an exception, what's going to happen to that exception? It's not caught in this method. So what happens is, if an exception is not caught by a method, it propagates to the method that called that method. Now what method called show input dialog? Main. And so as a result, Main will see that this thing threw an exception. When it calls this, what it will see is an exception coming back. So if main called F, which called G, which called H, and H throws an exception, and thus it's called, that exception will propagate all the way back up to main. You can catch it anywhere along the way, anywhere where a call was made. Yeah? Where is show input dialog? Is that are automatically already in there? Be, no, show show input dialog is, is, she asked where that is. That's in the CS 1410 library okay. that you get whenever you create a, a project with CPM. Okay? So, uh, and it turns out that the exception that show input dialog throws is coming from somewhere else still. 
Okay. So um, yeah, let me just show you this. Let's print the stack trace out. See where the exception came from. So I'm going to uh, run this. I'm going to enter something that's not a number. I say OK. It says it ca caught the exception, but it also displayed the stack trace because I asked it to. So you see main called show double input dialog, which called parse double, which called uh, parse double, which called read Java format stream. So the exception that originated here was not caught by that parse double, was not caught by that parse double, was not caught by show double input dialog, was finally caught by main. Okay. Let's look at another one. This is exceptions three. This shows how to throw an exception. I was already showed how to do that. So this is a method that takes a string S and uh, it wants the string to be to, to consist of double tokens. So it reads all the double tokens, adds them up, and returns the result. If it encounters a token that's not a double, it throws an illegal argument exception. So let's look at how it does it. We create a scanner, right? You know how to do that. It writes an accumulation. There is an accumulation loop. So it says, while there's a next double, add the next double into the sum. So this, this loop here is going to go round and around and around, reading a double, adding it in, reading a double, adding it in, reading a double, adding it in, until scan dot next double returns false. Now when that happens, when that loop ends, why would the, what are the two things that could cause a loop to end? What are the two things that would cause has next double to return false? Yeah? Either okay, he said either there's no more tokens, or the next token is not a double. So after the loop ends, what I do is I say, okay, if there is another token in the scanner, then it must be, it's not a double token, or we would have consumed it. And so I just throw a new, I throw an illegal argument exception right there. Otherwise, I return the sum. So just like when you return, when you hit a return statement, method's over. When you execute a throw statement, method's over. So this is a method called sum of tokens, which throws an exception. But that's, that's how you make a, a method that throws an exception. Okay. And if we were to run it, let's say in here, exceptions three dot sum of tokens. What's going to happen? What are we going to see when I execute this? Not a hard question. I'm sure someone can answer it. Yeah? Right. The method will throw an illegal argument exception. Now, if we were calling sum of tokens from some other method, we could, we could catch it. In fact, you know, if, if you're patient enough, I could come here and I, I could, in JShell, I could do this. Now, it's going to take too long to type because I have to type it all in order. But uh, I could hit, I could write a try catch block and it would work just like it would if you were in another method. But I'm, I'm not that patient. Okay, so now we see how to throw it. We've seen how to catch exceptions how they propagate, how to throw it. Let's see what this next one is. Now, I'm going to come back to exceptions four because I want to go back to this method right here. And what I want to do is I want to make this thing bulletproof. I want this thing to work as follows. It'll prompt the user to enter a non-negative number. If the user hits cancel, the program's over. If the user enters a non-negative number, it'll display the square root, the program's over. If the, um, if the, user, if, if the user, though, enters a non, you know, garbage, it's okay. I want it to display an error message and reprompt. 
Tell it again, enter a non-negative number. And keep doing that until the user enters, either enters something good or gets canceled. Okay? Now what's it going to take to make the program behave like that? Yeah? Okay, it's going to take a loop, right? Because how many times are we going to have to prompt the user? And she said this, right? We don't know. We may prompt the user once. We may prompt the user a hundred times. It just depends how long it takes them to either hit cancel or enter a valid number. Okay? So uh, let's put this stuff in a loop. Now, this will look kind of weird. While true. So what kind of loop is that? Yeah? It's an infinite loop. So as written, it would never stop unless there was an unhandled exception. It would just spin around prompting and displaying numbers until, until an exception was thrown to end it. Okay? So we, uh, that's just my start here. We've got to have a way to end the loop, obviously. Okay. So what do we do? How do we deal with it cancel? How do we, what, what should we do if the user hits the cancel button, which means that this input variable is going to contain null? What should we do when the input variable contains null? Okay. We can do what we did in the other program, add an if statement, <coughs> and then return. Right, so we can say if input equals null, return. I've told you before, it just seems like... <laughs> Using four lines to do that return of this statement is supposed to be one. This is one of my exceptions to, to my formatting rule. So if input's null, method's over. The, it, so notice the, in, the infinite loop is no longer infinite. So as, as unit hits cancel, uh, we hit return, the loop is exited, the main is exited, program's over. Okay? So that's good. If we run it and we hit cancel, the program ends. Okay? Before, there would have been an uh, unhandled exception. Let me just show you what progress we've made. I guess I showed you this before. We come here, we hit cancel. There's an unhandled exception because of that null. There we deal with it. Now, what about the problem of the user enters garbage? It's not, it doesn't parse as a double. Well, let me ask you something that just occurred to me. Why does parse double throw an exception when the input is bad? Why doesn't it return like negative 17.1? Why didn't it say, okay, if the user, uh, if the number is garbage, I return negative 17.1. That's how you know that the user entered garbage. Why wasn't that design decision made? Yeah? The user could input negative 17.1. Yeah. A user that wanted to enter negative 17.1 would be upset when they were told that their, user, their input was garbage. There are just not any doubles to any doubles left over, really. So we throw an exception. So what do we need to do to avoid um, the problem? Yeah. So I'm going to catch, so I'm going to put this try inside the loop. Now, you might think about while I'm doing it, why did I do this instead of wrapping? I could have put the try outside the while. I could have the while loop contained in the try block. Instead, I'm going to put it here. So why do I put the try block inside of the loop? Yeah. You said if I put it outside, no, no. If I put the try outside the while, if an exception was thrown, the while loop would end, and the exception would be caught. But what's the problem with that? Wow, lots of people want to tell me. Let me get back there. Again. Right, the loop will end, and the, the whole point of the loop 
was so we could keep asking them. So what should we do when we cast the exception? Yeah? Uh, you could do another a dialogue that says, if it about please enter. Yeah. So we'll just display a message saying, invalid input, please try again. So now notice the flow of control. The user comes along, enters garbage. Well, that garbage gets into input. It's not null, so we continue. It's parsed, and an exception is thrown. The exception is caught here. It displays the message. And then what happens after the catch block finishes? Really haven't talked about that. When the catch block finishes, the whole try is complete. So what happens when the try is complete? The while loop spins again. We, we've hit the end of the loop, so it goes up again. And it'll reprompt. So now, if we do this, I enter garbage. I say, OK. It says, invalid input, please try again. The loop is still running. And it'll run forever until I finally enter something that's good. And I say, OK. And it says the square root is that. And then it says, enter a non-negative number. Well, that didn't go according to plan. As soon as I get the square root, I'd like this calculator to end. How can I do that? Yeah? Um, you can add a return statement after you. Yeah, I'll just say return here. So once it displays the, the answer, it just returns. That ends the loop, ends the method, game over. So this is a very ad hoc loop. You know, it's not a accumulation loop. It, it's None of those. It's just there to make our user interface work. Yeah. Uh, what if you add like a break statement instead? Okay. So the, the break statement you can only use inside of a loop. And what that means is terminate the loop right now. So what would happen with a break? Yeah? It would end the loop. And that's the last statement in the method. So main, main would end. So it would work exactly the same way. If I come here, I run it, I enter a good number, I say OK, that works. Now, what else could go wrong? What if I enter a negative number? I'm being asked for a non-negative number. So I'm going to enter negative 098, and I say OK. I get that answer. The square root is not a number. How would I deal with that? Yeah, front row. Right. If x is less than zero, I say something like uh, negative number entered. Else. Break. So if the user enters a negative number, it'll display negative number entered. About zero. Yeah, zero is okay. Zero has a square root. You said non negative. Yeah, zero is non negative. So if I say negative number entered, if it says that, then it'll skip the else, it'll go to the end of the loop, and it'll go again. So let's try that out. Non negative number. So I enter negative A. It says negative number entered, it prompts me again. This time if I end just eight, then it gives me the square root. Program over. So we've sort of, we've made it bulletproof. And what you find, how much of this program, think about it, how much of this program is concerned with just communicating with the user, and how much does an actual calculation? The actual calculation we learned how to do on the first day. Okay. Where's the actual work, the calculation this thing does? And where's the stuff that is there so the user will have a pleasant experience? Yeah? yeah. There's the actual calculation. We take the square root of x. Everything else is there for the benefit of the user. 
That's why I didn't start the class out by having us write complete programs. I had you write pieces that, that did actual calculations. Because when you start interacting with a user, and users can make mistakes, the amount of code you have to write just goes way up. It's not particularly interesting code. It's, it's hard to think of all the ways things can go wrong. And, but, you know, that's just part of that's the game. But at this point, we know enough now to, to look at this and understand it and uh, try to write bulletproof code. So your next assignment will involve implementing some methods. So I'm, I'm going to give you an implementation of an algorithm that's missing several key methods. You'll provide those methods. And then you will uh, take my method, which works now, and use it to create a user interface similar to this one here. Yeah? This question is kind of out there. If could I, instead of having a, a line loop, could I just call the method again, the main method from the catch portion um, of the code? Uh, yeah, you could you could make main recursive that way. He's asking, could main call main? Um, it wastes it wastes space. So you could eventually run out of space that way. So it's better to use a loop. Okay. So whenever you write methods that deal with the users, and also in other times, you're going to have to deal with exceptions. So let's take a short break, and we will uh, look at some more examples.
Let's start again. Does anybody have a computer charger? Okay, so this is the example we looked at 15 minutes ago. Uh, it opens a scanner to read from a stream, uh, sends numeric tokens, and then either returns or throws an exception. And a number of people have asked me when they write scanner programs, they're bothered by this uh, yellow underscore that says resource leak. The scanner's never closed. And I promised you I'd show you a better way to do that. And now the time is here. So, uh, I mean, one thing you can do is call scan.close. So where would we have to put scan.close to do that? Where would we have to close it? Each time you're done with it. Okay, you have to, you know, you, you, you close it when you're not going to use it anymore. So we would have to put it here. We'd have to say here, scan.close. Close it right before we return, or, or through an exception, or we have to put it here, and also put it here, because we could exit either way. Now the problem with that is, maybe there's some exception this thing throws that we haven't thought of. So if, if the code up here ends by throwing an exception, the scanner's not going to be closed. It's only going to get closed if, it, if, it, if the execution gets down here. So the better way to do it is never to call the close method. It's to do it this way. So all I've done is rather than open the scanner before the try block, I have in parenthesis put the code that says scanner scan equals new scanner s. This is called a try with resources. So it's exactly the same as a try block, except you are allowed to open a resource as part of the, of the next to the try keyword. Yeah. I figured it, it probably had something to do with the um, unclosed scanner that I can't find a way. It won't seem. It doesn't seem to let Java doesn't seem to want me to run this program. Well, it has nothing. It? Nothing to do with that. I can look at it later and see why. Okay. Just so, to give me an option. yeah. The deal is, if you open your scanner that way, when Control exits the try block, whether it exits because we just executed beyond the end of the try block or because an exception was thrown, or because we returned from inside the try block, no matter how control leaves the try block, the scanner will be closed for us to automatically. So there are a handful of things in Java that can be opened and closed. Scanners are one of them, the only one we've seen so far. We'll later see things like input streams and output streams that can be opened and closed. So when you open, do it with a try. And then it's automatically closed for you. You don't have to worry about it. Yeah. So if we need to use two scanner uh, objects, how would mm -hmm. that work? You could open, you could do this as well. I think it's, I'm going to have to test it because I don't do it that often. You've got to call it something different. Yeah, you just set, just semicolon and the next thing. So you can. You can open as many resources as you want to there in the try block, and they're, they're both, in this case, they'll both be closed when executes and leaves the try block. That's a very handy thing. Uh, it wasn't added to Java until, I don't know, four or five years ago. Well, no, probably more, anyway. It wasn't in Java at the beginning. I, I, it's hard for me to tell how long the things work. Cause that's what happens when you get old. Okay? So, handy thing to know. Any questions about that? It's actually pretty simple. Yeah? Can you say why Java wants you to close the scanner? Or what does that mean? Okay, he's asking why does Java want you to, throw it to close the scanner? Well, one thing you can do is you can take a scanner that reads from a file. And once that file is opened, it can't be used by another program on your computer until it's closed. So it doesn't matter whether or not you close a scanner that's reading from a string. If you reading from a file, and your program runs for a long time, you want to make sure that you close that scanner when you don't need the file anymore or you're preventing other programs from using it. Yeah? Um, why, why did you put two scanners into the try? Why did I, I put two scanners because the student wanted to know how you did it. So I was just showing. It's not necessary for the program, but 
you can you can open multiple resources that way. It's like a, it looks like same as a four way. Okay. Now, there's a little bit of fine print related to exceptions. I'm going to show you here. This is an example of reading from a file. So this method takes a file name. It creates a scanner to read from the file. So we say new file, we give it the file name. It opens the file and creates a scanner to read from it. The scanner and the file will both be closed when the try block terminates. Now notice, I don't have a catch down below. If, you, if you're opening resources, you're not required to have a catch part to the try. If you, uh, don't, if you aren't opening a resource, you have to have catch. Okay. And I just have a loop here that loops through the, the file looking for the longest token. It's just an optimization loop, and then it returns it. So let's see how it works. Uh, I have Pride and Prejudice in my uh, folder here. You can see Pride and Prejudice is right there. It's directly inside the source folder. There it is. And I'm, I want to print out the longest token in Pride Prejudice. So we run the program. And that's, that's the longest token it finds. Now, you might argue that's two words, and it is. But to the scanner, it's you know, a single token because there's no white space in there. And we could customize the scanner to, to, to treat a hyphen as, as, as if it were a white space. But anyway, that's what the program does. So that program worked on a real, pro, you know, a real uh, file with thousands and thousands of tokens. So one thing I've just shown you is how to read from a file. You want to read from a file? You, you need the, the path to the file. You know, I didn't give a path here. I just said Pride and Prejudice. If you're running inside of Eclipse and you just give the file name, it'll look for it in your project. It opens the file, then you create a scanner from that, then you do your thing with the scanner. You know all about scanners. So you can work on files just like you've worked on strings. Just create a scanner that takes its stuff from a file. Now, what I wanted, the, the, the other point of this is this thing right here. This is what I call fine print. Throws file not found exception. Let me take it out and show you what happens. We get an error and it says, unhandled exception type file not found exception. All right, here's the fine print. Java labels some exceptions as checked exceptions. It turns out that file not found exception is a checked exception. The other ones that we looked at, like illegal argument exception, or array index out of bounds exception, or uh, number format exception, are unchecked exceptions. Checked exceptions are treated specially. If you write a method and inside the method, you call something that throws a checked exception, that may throw a checked exception when it's called. And the scanner may throw a checked exception when it's called, if that file doesn't exist. You must either catch the exception, which I'm not doing, or you must advertise the fact, oops, that your method may throw a checked exception. This doesn't mean that you will all, notice it's throws, not throw. This is just an advertisement saying, beware. If you call me, I may throw one of these nasty checked exceptions. Checked exceptions are generally exceptions that occur because of things in the outside world the program can't control. Often centered around input and output. Okay, so we, you know, the exception will be thrown. If the exception is thrown, it won't be called. It will propagate, and we have to advertise that fact. Now, up here, I also say the main may throw. Why did I have to put throws and file not found exception there? Yeah? Same deal. Uh, longest token may throw a checked exception. It says so right there. We've either got to catch it in here, or we've got to advertise the fact that it may throw it. If I had called it here, and if I put this in a try block and caught that exception, 
I wouldn't have to advertise it up in the header. Okay, I'm just telling you this not because it's anything intrinsically interesting about it. It's just you'll run into it. And this way you won't be completely surprised. You'll just be slightly mystified when it happens. Okay, here's another example. And now well, that's not a very interesting example, so I'm going to skip it. Other things more important than doing that right now. Okay. So I've shown you a lot about uh, exceptions now. Let's look at this one. Okay, so the, the, what it says here in the documentation is it says obtains a file from the user and displays the number of lines it contains. And it, and it throws a file not found exception sometimes. Let's see how it works we call uh, show open file dialog. And that's one we haven't looked at before. Let's go look and see what happens. Let's take this expression and let's go to uh, JShell. And let's try it out. Uh, rats, how do you paste? Like that. Okay, so we're gonna call dialogs.show open file dialog. Okay, and just up pops a regular old file dialog. And I can go through it and go find something to, to select. This is, this is potentially embarrassing. I don't know where I'm going. Uh, and when I click OK, it gives me back the full path name to a file. Okay, so I'm opening the file dialog. I am creating a scanner to read from it. It would be better if I did it in a try block. And then I count the lines, and then I show how many lines there were. Okay? Uh, so if I just run the program and find that thing, it says the file contains 22 lines. Okay, so that's another example. This is something that you probably need to use in the next assignment to, uh, to get to, if you want to read from a file. And I think I'd intended, when I put this example in, talk about um, making this bulletproof. But it'd be the same sort of thing, making this bulletproof uh, to deal with the cancel button. It would involve another loop. And that's similar enough to the previous one that uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over making this bulletproof. Oops, wrong thing. Okay, now I'm going to switch gears slightly here. Because I want to tell you about something different. We talked about arrays last time. And arrays are lists of things. An array is a list. But what's special about a list when it's an array? What limitation does it have? Yeah. Well, I don't know about limitation, but I was going to say it's mutable. Well, it's mutable. That's true. But what's its limitation? An array has like a set amount of objects, whereas an array list can get it. Okay, an array list is a fixed length. Array. An array is fixed length. Okay? Um, array lists, so arrays are built into the Java language. Array lists were added later as part of the library. Uh, and array lists are like arrays, except all the syntax is different, and they can grow and shrink. Okay, so you may think they're nothing alike uh, because the syntax is all different, but they, they serve the same niche. They they're represent lists, which are very important in programs. So remember, to declare an array, you say, in this case, the example is string followed by a square bracket. I, I need to get my uh, pointer here. To declare an array, it's type name, square bracket, and then variable name. To declare an array list, you say array list, and then in angle brackets, you give a type name like stream. Okay? We'll, we'll learn more about these angle brackets later, but that's how you declare an array list of strings. Now, to make matters worse, if you want an array list of ints, you have to declare, you have to spell int as capital I-N-T-E-G-E-R. And for right now, I don't want to explain why, except that the thing in angle brackets has to be a reference type. It can't be a primitive. 
So you, you, if you want an array of ints, you have to say integer. And if you want an array of doubles, you have to spell it with a capital D. If you want an array of chars, you have to say character with a capital C, and Boolean with a capital D. What a crock. Okay? I, I, I hate that, but that's just the way it is. Okay? To create a new array, you say new, type name, and then the, the size of the array in square brackets. So this creates a 20 element string array. This creates a 20 element int array. Over here, you say new array list of string and then empty parentheses. So that creates an empty array list of strings and empty array list of integers. Over here, if you want to access the element index 6, you say a sub 6. If you've got an array list, there's a get method, a.get6. That gives you the element at index 6. If you want to change an array, you say a sub 5 becomes hello. That stores something into index 5 of the array. Over here, it's a.set index 5 thing to store there. To get the length of an array, you say a.length. To get the length of an array list, it's the method size. And an array can't grow or shrink. A uh, array list can. There's an add method that adds to the end. Uh, there's also variants of the add method that will add elsewhere. And then there's a remove method that removes something in a specific index. So I use arrays when, when I'm forced to, basically, or when I know I need something of fixed length. And when I say I'm forced to, it's because the language requires arrays, like the, the arguments to me. That's an array. No way around it. But if I have an array, if I need something I know needs to grow and shrink in size, Skip arrays, use array lists. Okay, so that's a lot to, lot to present you with, but you can come back and look at this. I want to show you a few examples of array lists in action because you're going to need to, you'll be having array lists in action in your next assignment. So let's look at a couple examples. Okay, so this is a program that, as you can see, it says it prompts the user for a file that can, that's supposed to contain only int literals. It sorts the ints and displays the median integer. So it displays the one in the middle. So basically it, it shows you if you, you know, if you took the array, the ints and sorted it, which one would be in the middle. So let's see how it works. We open the file dialog by saying select a text file containing only ints. The user clicks on a file, hits OK. That file is stored right there. So now we got a file. If file is null, we return. Why would file be null? You just ask the user to pick a file. If it was returned by the method, why would it be null? What do you think? Yeah? The Yeah, the user hit the cancel button. So if, if they hit the cancel button, we return right there. Because the user wanted to cancel. We uh, open the scanner right there. And it would have been better to use a try with resources here. Then I have a method called find median int. And it reads from the scanner, returns the median, which we display. Now things can go wrong. The file may not exist, in which case we display no such file. It may be that the scanner contains something that's not an int, in which case we say non-int found. It may be that uh, there aren't any ints at all. So there's no median element to be had. And so we catch that exception and display something reasonable. But my focus is right here on find median int. It doesn't involve any input and output. It involves lists. So let's look at what it's doing. What does this line right here do? Look at that and tell me what it does. Yeah. Okay, it makes an array list and stores it in the variable lines. What does this array list contain? How many elements does it contain? Yes? Right, it's empty. When it's created, it's empty. Okay, so we get an empty array list we call lines. Now look at this loop. What's happening? What does that loop do? Yeah? It's adding the integer into the array. Okay. So each time through the loop it says, is there another token? If so, scan the int in, add it to the array list. 
So as each new token is read, it gets added to the array list, and the array, the array list grows. So if this loop spins around 100 times, because there's 100 tokens, when we're done with the loop, the array list will contain 100 elements, indexed from 0 to 99. It's easy as that. You just add to the end, and it grows. Okay. At that point, we've exhausted the scanner, or, yeah, we've exhausted the scanner. What's happening there? What are we testing there? Yeah. Right. He said if we're testing if the while loop ran at all. Maybe that file didn't contain any ints at all, and so the list is empty. So we're saying if the list is not empty, then do something. Otherwise, we throw that exception right there, because we promised to throw a no such element exception if there weren't any ints. Okay? So we do the test and decide whether to return an int or throw an exception. Now, what happens if, notice we're asking, is there an X token? But then, we read an int. What happens if the next token is not an int? What's this method going to do? What happens if you call next, uh, next int on a scanner and the next int isn't? The next thing isn't an int. Yeah? Right, the scanner throws an exception. In particular, it throws the, no sub the input mismatch exception. So that'll be thrown, and the, and the method will terminate. Okay? Well, let's suppose that, we're, that the file is good and there were some lines. There were some numbers. Okay? That's just a built-in method, collections.sort, that'll sort an array list. So now it's sorted. And what's the last thing we do? What are we returning? Notice we're using the get method. So we're getting something from the array list. What are we getting? Yeah? OK. So I'm taking the size and dividing it by 2. So if there's 100 elements, I divide it by 2, I get 50. That's the element as close to the center as we can get, because we want the median element and we return it. So we're just using the get method. We sort it the array into ascending order. We pull out the middle element. That's the median. <coughs> so that's what, that's what that method does. It uses, it creates, it creates an empty array list. It adds to the array list. Uh, it gets the size of an array list. It calls a built-in static method that knows how to sort array lists. And it uses the get method to pull something out in the middle. That's a typical way that you use a list. I'm going to show you one more example, but before I move on to that, I'll have a few minutes for that. Any questions I could answer here? Because like I say, on your next assignment, you'll be doing this sort of thing. Yeah. So what does the next int do again, the scan dot next int? It reads the next token from the scanner and converts it to an int. That's what next int does. And if that conversion fails, then we get the input mismatch exception. If it succeeds, we get an int. Let me get yours first. Yeah. Does the new element get added at the end of the list? Uh, yes. He asked, does it get added in the list? If you use that version of add, wherever it is, uh, it adds to the end of the list. There's another version of add where you can tell it the index at which it should be added or inserted. Okay, now, one more thing that you need to know. Okay, same program. Well, similar program, but it, well, let me just show you the documentation up here. It obtains a file from user, contains only ints, it computes the median and the mean, and then writes those values to a file chosen by the user. <coughs> so this program actually uh, is going to write to a file, which is the, the main point of it. 
So let's see what's going on up here. We open the file dialog, we get a file. If the file is null, we return because the user hit cancel. Otherwise, we open a scanner and we do that. So <coughs> notice numbers is declared up here as an array list. So what do you think is happening here? What is that code doing? It's calling a method called get ints. What does it return? What type of thing does get ints return? It takes a scanner as input. What's it returning? Look at the clues up there. Tell me what it returns. Yeah. It returns an array list of integers. Because we're taking what it returns and storing it right there. All right, so get ints, I won't dwell on it. It's similar to what we just saw. It just creates an empty array list, fills it up with ints, and returns it. Simple method that just uses a accumulation loop to fill up an array of uh, an array list of ints. Okay? Lots of things can go wrong, so there's a try block here that deals with everything that can go wrong. But assuming we survive and get down to here, <coughs> what do we do? What's happening here? Look at that. That looks different. This is show save dialog. We've looked before at show open di file dialog. So what do you think is the difference? What does show, what does show save di file dialog going to do? Right. It's for, it's for, so show save dialog opens up a file dialog, and you pick a file to which you want to write. Okay? So we get back the file to which we want to write. If the output file is null, we return, goes usually get canceled. Otherwise, we call this method save results. We give it a list of numbers and an output file. Okay? And here is save results. Let's see what we do. We make sure there's at least one number. If there isn't, we throw an exception. Next thing we do is we write this loop right here to compute the average, to compute the mean. So we loop through the list. And this is that new for each loop I talked about last time, or started to talk about. You give it a list right there. Uh, what that says is this loop runs, and it takes, in turn, it takes every number from the list and assigns it to n. So that's a really fast, easy way to iterate through all the elements in a list. You just say, for each int n in the list, do something. So it's just adding. We compute the mean. We compute the median by sorting. And this is just the way we did it before. So now we have the mean and the median. And look right there. My last point of the day, what's happening in the highlighted region of code? First of all, why are we using a try block? Yeah? Because it takes the resource output and then after the try block ends, it closes that file. Okay. So there's a new thing here called a print stream. So you can use print streams to write to files. We create a print stream that's going to write to that file. That's what this statement here is. Okay. We do it in the try so that when so that file will be closed when we exit the try block. And then you can say output.println. That prints a line consisting of mean, colon, and the mean. And this prints another line with the median on it. Where have you seen print line before? System.out. System what type of object is system.out? It's a print stream. What's the difference between system.out and this print stream right here? System.out goes to the console, and output goes to a file, because it goes to the file output file. So ever since you've been printing to system.out, you've known how to write to files. You're writing to a special file, the console. Writing to another, a real file is no different. You just have to create the print stream appropriately. You create a print stream to write to a file, and then you just use print lines like you've used before. Okay. So we've done a lot today, I realize. Uh, I want to at least give you a chance to start on the assignment over the weekend if you choose. 
we can revisit some of this stuff on Monday uh, as necessary. Um, so don't panic if some of it flew over your head. Uh, you'll see it again.